Alec, let me ask you this. Given the experiences that Kiana has shared, given how Blake has talked about how they work with their clients, I want to get back to the litigation a little bit. Um, and then I want us to start talking about some solutions. With respect to the litigation, what is the kind of evidentiary material that is most helpful to you? Obviously, talking about these first person experiences um, is helpful. Um, but you know the kind of work that LB is doing at the Brennan Center um, and the report that she's now working on where she's looking at cost and revenue and actual hard data, tell us more about how that material is utilized and how it is or is not helpful to you as someone who's litigating these cases um, and what kinds of other evidentiary information is helpful in bolstering these cases. The kinds of stuff, so I actually first found out about this area when I read this Brennan Center report a few years ago. Uh, and I, I was a federal public defender at the time, and I was really concerned with how many years or decades my clients were going to spend in a cage. And I had no sense, really, that the, the entire foundation of, of, of the low level, I mean, by far the most interactions people were having with the criminal system was, was because of criminal justice debt and very low level offenses. And, and my world was sort of turned upside down. That's when I decided to start um, thinking through uh, how this low-level stuff really drives the, the engine of mass incarceration in this country. Um, so uh, I think it can be helpful just in, in terms of inspiring people to actually understand the vast majority, the bulk of what the legal system is actually doing every day is not serious violent felony offenses. It's actually um, this much more routine, mechanized processing of low-level misdemeanor cases and traffic cases. Um, that was a really big, and I think the, telling that story is really important with some of this data. I think in terms of litigation, it comes into, a, in, plays a significant role really at two stages. First, the investigative stage. Of looking at some of the data across jurisdictions, you can tell which jurisdictions are the worst abusers and where you might be able to do the most good. So for example, uh, I got connected to Arch City Defenders when Blake was still in law school, actually. Uh, the Arch City Defenders, so you can't take credit for this. Uh, Arch City Defenders produced an incredibly valuable white paper, which I read in the New York Times. And I had just litigated and won this case in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, I, I read this white paper, and, and crazy things were, were in this white paper. The Ferguson averaged 3.6 arrest warrants per household. Imagine that. Uh, a city in this country, 2.2 arrest warrants for every adult in the town. Imagine what that does to people when you're, uh, when you're thinking about whether you're going to leave your home that day and wondering, is this the day that, that metal shackles are put on my, my hands and I'm taken away from my family for three or four or five days or nine days or 12 days or 15 or like some people I met 20 or 30 or 40 days as they get shuffled from 81 municipal different jails. You know, a lot of these people have tickets in nine different jails. So whenever they get arrested, they go to nine different places and they stay in each place for three days until the jail decides they can't get any money out of them. They go to the next jail, right? Um, and, and so uh, hearing that a city like Ferguson had 3.6 arrest warrants per household, mostly for unpaid debt, was a big red flag, right? That's somewhere we need to go and see what's happening. Uh, and we've, we've seen that all across the country in, in different areas. So these, this collection of data that organizations like the Brennan Center are doing is really vital in that respect. And then the second area that I've seen it come in, in, in handy is a lot of these cases, as I mentioned, um, uh, there's really no defense on the other side. Now, sure, there are a variety of doctrines that the federal courts have concocted to prevent themselves from doing justice, um, like sort of procedural doctrines like, oh, you know, uh, there's this thing called immunity, right, which is an absurd concept. You can do horrible things and, and not have any accountability for it, or abstention, or mootness, or all these other, um, or these, these sort of collateral attack doctrines where you have to challenge what happened to you in the state courts before you can come to federal court and seek vindicate. All of these crazy things that you learn about in fed courts that, that are um, really silly. Uh, th those types of doctrines aside, there's really no defense to what has been, there's no defense on the merits to any of these practices. So when we get into these, these um, litigation battles with these cities and, and other government officials, um, once we get past some of that procedural thicket, uh, they have nothing left to say. And, and so then we get to the settlement table. And it can be extremely helpful in coming to, to, to negotiate with the city if you can show them data that says, if you adopt what we're saying, not only will you be doing the right thing and treating human beings fairly, but you'll also be saving 
uh, $3.2 million over 10 years, or something like that, right? And, and that's been a powerful argument with some people. Uh, you know, the first city that we sued in our bail cases, which is sort of a related area that we've been doing a litigation on, in the first six months after we got rid of money bail for misdemeanors in that city, it's a small town, they only arrest about 1,000 people a year, um, they saved $100,000 uh, and 3,300 days in jail. Uh, for people, just because they weren't charging a few hundred dollars bail in every case. And if you can collect those examples, and if someone can write reports about them, then you can show them to the next jurisdiction as you, as you move on. And once more and more jurisdictions are doing it, and the sky isn't falling um, when you stop caging poor people, then people say, oh my gosh, you know, we saved all this money in police overtime, we saved all this money in our, our jail, uh, you know, uh, medical costs at our jail used to be $4 million a year, now they're only $2.8 million a year. And, and we can start seeing some, and I think that, as I understand it, that's one of the main goals of this new Brennan Center project, which is to produce an accurate, because a lot of the costs of this stuff aren't reflected on budgetary lines. And so I, without work like this, I can come in and I say, I'm hypothesizing that you're going to save a lot of money in all of these other ancillary areas. Like right now, you're paying your prosecutor $80,000 a year, and she's spending 20% of her time on failure to appear warrants for unpaid debt. So I think you know that means you have sixteen thousand dollars in savings. Whatever. But it's 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 one thing to just say that as some you know crazy you know, prison abolitionist from D.C. But it's another thing to have a study done by real experts uh, who who can actually. Sh and I think so. That's what is encouraging about some of this data in terms of um, other evidence. So so th this kind of data is actually not all that helpful in the actual litigation of the claims on the merits. Mm -hmm. But these cases, again, don't turn too much on that. In terms of litigation of the case on the merits, by far the most helpful thing are the stories that we tell to the judge about what happened to people and the court documents. I mean, I can't emphasize enough, um, some of these court documents themselves are just smoking guns. You know, the, the first case that we litigated in one, uh, they were hand, the, 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 the town was handing everyone court documents that said, pay us $2,807 or sit 59 days in jail. I mean, they were just admitting. I mean, they were just, they were, they were, they, they were just uh, writing on a sheet of paper that you could either have a choice of paying or going to jail, and they weren't uh, inquiring into whether the person could pay. And the, collecting those documents, those little, I thought she took a photo of that document. It was the first thing I showed to the federal judge. And the federal judge was baffled. Just it was incomprehensible. Um, that, and, and my client had actually written on the back of it. She was desperately, she'd gotten a pencil in the jail and she was desperately writing the days one through 59 on the back of the sheet of paper and, and subtracting it from 2,807. And all of these little paper calculations were there and I took a photo of that for the judge. And, uh, and the judge, I mean, looking at that, little pieces of evidence that, that, that tell a story of, of what someone was going through um, have been by far the most important piece of evidence in our cases. And so when, you, when you're going, if any of you are lawyers going out there thinking about uh, how to bring these kinds of cases, I would say get as many of the documents and, and papers from your client's case as possible. What, what does the debt collection letter that the local court sent out to them look like? What does it say? Does it threaten them if they don't pay, they're gonna go to jail? Oftentimes, these jurisdictions were so unaware of what the basic governing legal principles are in this area that they were putting on paper uh, uh, rampant federal constitutional violations. And so uh, we can, I mean, I don't know how interesting that we can talk in much more detail about how to build an investigation into these kinds of practices. But, but for me, uh, the data piece that you all are working on is incredibly important in terms of helping us identify the, the best places to target and then convincing those places that what they're doing is wrong. Now, LB, um, of course, our latest report is not done. But can you just give us some sense of preliminary findings uh, of, uh, of, of, of what the data, what story the data is starting to tell us at this point? Well, thank you, Alec, for saying that because it is hard um, to sometimes sit on the phone and, you know, this project really um, marries the sort of this advocacy and data collection. Um, and, you know, you learn about a lot of practices that just seem unconstitutional or just morally wrong but you need to just say okay tell me more about that tell me more about that you know just like you're sort of you know I think everyone doing this is a little bit of a journalist right I mean you're, you're just collecting as much information as you can um, and you know some of the practices that 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 we're seeing that we're going to be looking at um, and, and there are lots of ways you know you can litigate you can tell a story you can advocate this project is really about hard data because 
sort of our niche contribution at this point is how do we convince policymakers to change practices? And it's, it's sometimes very hard to change hearts, but um, sometimes it's easier to change minds if you can have a sort of intellectual argument about cost savings. And we've seen that across the mass incarceration spectrum. A lot of you know, conservative groups, you know, there's right on crime. Their main focus is let's look at, at cost savings. You know, um, let's look at what we're doing with taxpayer dollars. And you know, even if you do this work because you care passionately about making this a better, the world a better place, you, know, you need to realize that this hard data does change policymakers' minds, does change you know, conservatives' thinking on this. Um, and so what we're looking at is we're looking at law enforcement time. You, know, you talk to police officers across the country, depends on what jurisdiction you're in, We've spoken to some who say, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to run around and spend my day at a courthouse making sure some, you know, I've taken, I've stopped someone for a traffic ticket. I'm legally required to now do something, right? That's, and we've spoken to police officers who say, I had to spend six hours at a courthouse waiting for them to pay off the ticket at the window. That's six hours of law enforcement's time. That's not a good use. I mean, I think everyone in this room would probably agree that's just not a good use of law enforcement resources. Um, sending someone to jail for non-payment. I mean, it's absurd morally. It's absurd fiscally. There's, you know, the only, only, only argument you could ever make is deterrence, and that's just absurd. Um, the jurisdictions are not actually receiving money for that non-payment, right? It, they're spending 12-fold, 100-fold to actually jail that person. Um, we're also looking at old debt. And when we talk about fiscal costs, um, it is very, very expensive to collect debt that's more than a year or two old. The records are, are, are just not good. Um, the people have moved. It, it takes a lot of resources to collect old debt. So, you know, when we talk about data, when we talk about reforms, you know, it is likely that at the end of this project, you know, we will have, we're starting to see data that it just doesn't make a lot of fiscal sense to go after debt that's very old. So, you know, if you're a jurisdiction looking at you know, how to go forward with best practices, how to go forward on this issue, you know, there, there is a point of no return where you should, you know, just tell, just sort of leave it alone. Um, you know, and these are the types of things we're looking at. We're really looking at all the different costs. Um, and the idea is at the end of the day, we are looking at the ledgers and we're saying, all of you jurisdictions can tell us you know, that you're earning a million dollars off this revenue, but have you looked at how many court clerks are in your office spending their entire day doing this? You know, calling people, mailing letters, not getting the rest of their work done, not actually cleaning up the warrants that were, you know, that are on people's case files in error. You know, there's so much backlog in the courts and they're spending, you know, court clerks are spending so much of their day on this. Um, so we are hoping at the end of the day that you know great litigators um, like Alex and, and Blake and you know advocates like Kiana and policymakers can use this data um, for good. Elby, I have one quick question mm -hmm. and then one for Kiana and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, and I'm actually going to start with the judges. I, I have a, a, a question and I want you all to have an opportunity to speak. But um, you know, we all know as lawyers, LB, that there are statutes of limitations in most jurisdictions mm -hmm. with respect to debt collection. How is that applicable here? Uh, you've been asking me a legal question. <laughs> um, in terms of a statute of limitations, there I don't know of any regarding this because it's not it's not a, a crime, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you're charged with murder, you know, there's actually well, well actually I don't remember, is murder the one? You know, there's some yeah. crimes that that have statute of limitations. 
this is not a crime. It's just a consequence of whatever the charge was, right? I mean, it's really a collateral consequence. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be court rules, there may be policies, but I have, in my research thus far, I have not seen anything that says after five years, 10 years, we just don't do this. I if so, it's just practice, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's mm -hmm. not official law or policy. Thank you. Kiana, um, before we open it up to the rest of the group to, to ask us questions, from your perspective as an advocate, what, if you could give us maybe two or three things that could be done that if in your, if, if a genie popped up right now and said, Kiana, tell me what I can do to, to try to make this situation better from your perspective as an impacted person, what would those two or three things be? Would it be to have the legislature uh, in various states pass new laws uh, to help better control how fees and fines are, are, are dealt with? Would it be for Congress to do something? Would it be for the president to issue an executive order? What, from the advocate's perspective, do folks want to see happen? Um, before I answer that, I'd just like to make a statement um, with respect to the statute of limitations. Um, my first ticket that I received in 1998, <clears throat> I just found out that it was actually still in warrant status. Wow. Um, so mm. even though I've spent time in this muni municipality and paid fees, um, they still have me listed as wanted for um, failure to res register a vehicle. Um, <clears throat> and for the question, how could this be better? Good question. Um, we could not lock people up for being poor. Um, I'm not a bad driver. Um, the tickets that I received were for not having insurance and failure to register a vehicle and maybe a speeding ticket or two. Um, but it just, it seems like a waste um, to have people locked up because they can't pay. Um, it seems like a better use to offer other means of paying your debt to society. Um, and if we could just do that um, wholeheartedly all the way, then I think it would be better. It would be better to take in consideration um, a person's ability to pay. <clears throat> or take into consideration, you know, their their health status or what, what, whatever the reason was that maybe they missed a court day. I think that would be the the most dynamic change that would be made that could be made. Thank you. 